Welcome back to Optimize Your Website with our AMP. In the last lesson, we embedded three tweets down at the bottom of our page. And in this lesson, we're going to turn those three tweets into a carousel. In the AMP version of our site, that was done with the AMP carousel custom element. But we are going to be using this cool little script called Siemma. Now, Siemma ticks all the boxes that we're looking for with our scripts. It's light, it's a small file size, it's simple, we can load it asynchronously, and it doesn't have any dependencies. And we already added Siemma to our index.min.js script earlier when we set up our gulp file. And that has already been loaded in here, so it's ready for us to use. All we need to do is add a little code down here to activate our script. So the way that we do that is by creating a constant, and we're going to name it my Siemma. We're going to set that to equal a new instance of Siemma. And then in here, we're going to add an object with some parameters. So we're going to put a pair of curly brackets in here. We'll just make a space, make it a little bit easier to work with. And now we need to add the property selector. And we need to nominate the selector that Siemma should look for to then make a carousel out of its children. So we added this class slides in here. So if we target this with Siemma, then it's going to take each one of our tweets here, each one of these block quotes, and turn it into a slide that's in our carousel. So we want our selector to equal, and we'll put a colon, dot slides. So because our HTML is already set up, that should be everything we need to get the basic carousel up and running. Now, I've found with this script, you do have to hit the refresh button to get it to reload properly. And there, so now you can only see one of the slides. The other three are all in the wings waiting to be shown through here. So we want this carousel to autoplay. So we're just going to add a little extra code. We're going to tell it how long we want it to wait in between each of our slides. So we're going to say set interval. And then we're going to put another pair of brackets in here. We're going to put equals greater than my Siemma next 4,000. So what that's doing is just telling Siemma that we want the interval between each slide to be 4,000 milliseconds or four seconds. And then while we're at it, we'll also tell it that we want it to loop. So we'll add a comma and we'll put in loop true. All right, so there we go. Now that is automatically going from one slide to the next. As I mentioned, it does get a little funky if you don't refresh it properly. So it's going through one slide to the next. It's waiting four seconds in between. And now it's going to loop back to the start. All right, now there's still another thing missing, and that is some little buttons that we can use to manually go forward or back in our carousel. So to set up our buttons, the first thing that we're going to need to do is add a little extra HTML here. What we want to do is add some buttons inside the Twitter carousel div, but outside the slides div, because we don't want Siemma to treat these buttons as slides that need to be put into the carousel. Now, the way that we're going to create these buttons is with some directly embedded SVG shapes. And the code for these is very efficient. I'm just going to paste this in because it's not really something you can type in manually in SVG shape. So this little bit of code here is an SVG shape, and that's just going to create a little triangle that points off to the left. And this is going to create a little triangle that points off to the right. So that's great. We don't have to load in an image for that. That gives us even more fast load time. And the file size of this little bit of code to set up an SVG shape is incredibly small. You notice here we've got the class name prev on the first of our buttons and then next on the second one. And those are the classes that we're going to target with Siemma and tell it to treat those buttons as the forwards and backwards buttons for the carousel. So we're going to use a little JavaScript to find those elements in our code. This is where you might have been used to working with jQuery, but of course we're avoiding using jQuery in our site so that we don't have that additional code to load in. Instead, we're going to use document, query selector, and then we're going to put a set of brackets in here. And then we're going to specify the selector that we want to look for, which in this case is the class prev. Now we're going to add an event listener. So I'm going to say add event listener. I'm just going to end that line. The event that we want to listen for is click. So now when somebody clicks on that button on the left, we're going to trigger an action. So we're going to put a set of empty brackets. And then we're going to put equals greater than my Siemma prev. So then that sets up the behavior for the button on the left side. 
We're gonna do the same thing with the button on the right side, only this time we're gonna replace Preve with Next. All right, so let's check out what we've got. Once again, we'll give this a full refresh. And there we go, there's our previous and next buttons. And so if we click them, we can proceed through the carousel however we please. Now there's only one little bit of extra code that we need to add in, and that is because right now, if we turn off JavaScript, we have our nice little block quotes as our fallbacks, but we have these useless buttons here now. So in our NoScript style sheet, we just want to target the carousel button class that we have here. So we're going to grab that. And just set that to display none. We'll refresh. And there we go, that gets rid of the buttons. So now our full set of JavaScript fallbacks are all in place. We've got our font face fallbacks. We've got our lazy loading image fallbacks in place. Our just informative messages about the things that just absolutely cannot work without JavaScript. Our gallery works just fine. And we've got our little set of embedded tweets. And if we turn JavaScript back on, We've got our whole optimized site with everything that was in our AMP site. It's all there. We have the same functionality, even you know a little bit extra sometimes because we have the ability to create a gallery with this ability to page through. And now if we check out our load speed, And there's our time 1.71 seconds. And we'll compare it to the AMP version of our page. Which is 2.05 seconds. And you'll get a lot of fluctuation when you do these speed tests. So what you want to do is a heap of them. Sometimes you'll find your speed test is coming in at three seconds. Sometimes it'll be one second. So you really need to do quite a lot of them to average out your results and make sure that you really are getting the speed results that you think you are. But the main thing that you want to establish when you're doing this type of optimization is that you are getting load times that are comparable to the benchmark that's sort of set by AMP. If you are, then you know that your optimization is doing just fine. All right, so that wraps up the coding phase of our course. We just have one more quick video where I want to cover some optimization techniques that you ought to be employing that have nothing to do with how your site is coded and everything to do with how you get it out there on the web. And these are things that AMP does as part of its whole setup. So if you really wanna get results as good as working with AMP, then these are things that you need to consider using as well. So we're gonna go through those in the next and last lesson. I'll see you there.